Hi everyone, welcome back to another episode of the Swans Cast podcast in season four, as mentioned last week, episode two, and I'm joined by a newcomer today, so welcome Ben Church, his first time on the podcast, so yeah, welcome. Hi, right, thanks for having me. All good, so we've we've done a little bit of stuff together before through Gab Sutton on uh, Gab's um, content that is put out there on, uh, on Twitter. Um, so yeah, we thought we'd get together and bring Ben onto the podcast, and I'm happy to have him here. So it'd be good to see your views on, well, Swansea City, I guess. That's what we're here for, isn't it? So yeah, exactly. just before we get started, um, I want Ben to introduce himself. But before we get to that, just a reminder, obviously, we started a giveaway last week, so that's still up and running. Going to be drawn on the day of the first game of the season, which I believe from now we're recording on Friday the 28th of July. We've got just over a week uh, to next Saturday when we kick off the season against Birmingham. So we'll draw it that evening after the game. Uh, to enter, just head over to Twitter or Instagram. All the details are there. Um, there's a couple of ways to enter. And you can throw your hat in the pot. Your hat in the pot. You can throw your name in the pot. <laughs> name in the hat. Getting my um, sayings mixed up there. A couple of times, you can get a couple of entries and a couple of chances to win. So the prize is a Swansea City top of your choice from this season's collection. If the third kit is announced by then, that will also be an option. But I don't think it will be. Um I think we we were guessing maybe the second game of the season based on who we're playing. Where are we? We're away somewhere, aren't we? West Brom. Uh, yeah, so what's our home kit is white and our away kit is like kind of dark, bluey, navy yeah. colour. And what and West Brom playing white and blue. So that's what we are betting on. It's, it's going to be available for the second game. But we'll see. We'll see when that gets announced. Um, but yeah, so go get involved there and comment below if you have got involved and where you where you, where you um, did get involved, so we can make sure that we do include everyone in the draw. You have to be following on the platform as well, otherwise your vote or your entry doesn't get included. Okay, now we've got it all out of the way. Ben, welcome. Um, I just want to ask, first of all, your background and how you became a Swansea City fan, really. Okay, What's so, your story? Well, background first came a Swansea City fan, probably back to the, you know, Roberto Martinez days, Jordi Gomez, League One champion sort of thing. Um, season taken older only since Potter went down admittedly, but you know, been, been loving watching before that as well. Um, involvement in the club, I did actually have like a small role go back a few years. Um, I was sort of a community champion. You notice now Swansea doesn't have any um, gambling sponsorships on the front of his shirt. Yeah. Um, I was credited with, you know, partially helping that happen. I sort of got the ball rolling in a fans forum when Trevor Birch was chairman. And, you know, he, he seemed to like what I had to say. So he brought me back in and asked me to be a community champion, which I did for a bit. I was only 17. Um, but yeah, that, you know, it was a good experience. And uh, I sort of felt more connected to the club because of that. Yeah, sounds good. I was reading up on it. I know you've got um, a link on your, your Twitter um in regards to what happened with that so very well done that's good and Thank always you. nice to be a club that's pushing that i think we were quite early on yeah we were first, i think in um professional football at least in england yeah. to get rid of it and now i think it's from the 2026 premier league season <clears throat> that's going so it's a snowball to be fair to us yeah it's, it's definitely a conversation that you see when when kits are announced the stuff at the start of the season you do see discontent from fans and disappointment when their club has got that kind of sponsor still uh these days which shows the shift in opinion on on that sort of sponsorship deal especially on a front to shirt sponsor which i think because it's such in a public eye especially with kids and then you also get the situation where the kids can't have the same kit as an adult and yeah it, it's as, as a as a kid you just want to look up to your idols and and wear that shirt you're never quite having that opportunity so i think it's better all around that they are not then used so yeah well done on that um, oh, I you. mentioned your Twitter. Do you want to let everyone know where they can find you? Yeah, it's Jack Army underscore. Just a dead simple one. Yeah, so I think if you are watching on YouTube, you can see it on the screen. Um, obviously, don't forget the at sign. Oh, I say Twitter. Is it even called Twitter these days? Oh, I no, no, that's, 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 that's another X? podcast, that is. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> half of his Twitter and half of his X. It's always going to be Twitter. It's always going to be the stadium. You know, it's, it's like that. Uh, well, see how long he has it for. Yeah. <laughs> It, nice to see you met Trevor Birch as well. I kind of miss him being around the club. Uh, I'd imagine you feel the yeah, same. Yeah, it was a steady ship under Trevor Birch, wasn't it? I just think, um, you know, it was such a negative atmosphere after the relegation and towards the Americans, the owners. 
And his communication above everything else was so good. He mm. just to get a control and grasp of the situation and kind of like cool things down. Even though maybe some of the problems were still up there, he could, I guess, damage control a little bit. And it did feel like he actually cared as well what he was doing. Oh, he, de he definitely did care. I remember I was only there meeting him on a few occasions, but I, for example, I remember he had conversations with other members of staff in front of me and he'd met someone else for the first time. Some, I don't, I don't know who it was, but then, oh, what was her name again? You know, when you did the amateur yeah. people first, you're trying to learn every single person's name, how well he ran the club as well. You look back at like the fees he got, he got 18, was it 15 million, sorry, for Dan James a year in his deal. 18 was it 70 and a half million rising to 20 for McBurney? He got he got semi yeah. fees for a club that was massively in debt, so he, he's just very good at his job and head of the EFL now. So, we're going to speak about it later. But how how would we love his little influence on getting high fees right now with a certain <laughs> striker, not not too dissimilar to the output that McBurney would have been displaying in yeah, his time? Yeah, we'll definitely but we'll, we'll get on to that. Yeah, we'll get on to that. It's a big one. Um. Okay, so speaking about Swansea then, let's look back a little bit briefly onto last season before we obviously look ahead. Um, Russell Martin, not here anymore, of course, but how did you think we got on under last under Russell Martin last season? Do you think, you know, fair, fair finish in the end or underachieved, overachieved? What do you think? I mean, to be a few points off the playoffs after the Baron run we went on in the middle of the season, I, I think we probably exceeded where our performance was at, but equally I, I was sad to see him go. I think you could see how poorly the club's been run when there's all murmurs that we'd already decided he was gone in February. It, it may have just been a case that we didn't have the money to sack him, which is worrying. But then also you let him go on a run of seven wins and two draws at the end of the season. You're still pushing him out the door by not offering him a new deal. So it's concerning. You know, I, I like the new members of staff, senior members of staff that have come in. That goes right down to the management team as well as, you know, boardroom level. But yes, yeah, I just worry that Martin probably was as close to our philosophy as we were going to get, and now we push yeah. him at the door, sets a precedent for maybe where we're going in years to come. I think it's an interesting one because I have that's my general opinion on the face of it, but I do think there's a deeper narrative that would be it would be interesting to explore it. I don't think we'll ever get the answers. I do think Russell Martin was very wise in how he used a lot of the headlines the narrative to his favor mm -hmm. um i'm wondering how much he controlled that as well i'm not saying he did or didn't i i i'm sad to see him go as well but i'm just wondering if we all know the full truth of what happened behind the scenes or whether he did use it a little bit and play it off to to get where he wanted to be a little bit um we we'll never know um and i know there was some comments coming out from the was it Silverstone at the time that he was on Twitter and he was saying certain things? And I think I was very unprofessional, but I'm wondering where did that come from? Do you know what I mean? I just I just love to see what happens sometimes behind the scenes for it to get to the stage that it got to. Um ultimately Russell Martin's got a promotion, you'd have to say, so he's probably not losing too much sleep over what happened. No, of course not. I think the boiling point was January transfer window when yeah. we performed so appallingly in recruiting and letting you know players leave who maybe shouldn't have been leaving for the prices they were, and then to have the entire coaching staff out to the you know the press and say what they said. Not saying yeah. what they said was wrong, but to openly publicly go out against your bosses. It's yeah. It's always See that that's that's why I start asking the questions about the like. Was he being clever at the same? Like, I think he felt maybe he knew he had no interest in staying after the summer, is what I'm trying to say. And yeah, he started yeah. planning a narrative of like, um, I'm going to look as hard done by as possible here to like kind of get what I need to be, which fair play. I mean, you probably are hard done by. So if he did, what I'll say is he never stopped giving his all yeah. and acting as if he was staying for the long term and that showed with the results he had at the end you know he yeah. even publicly saying you know Lata Bordier was a big one I know Manning was always leaving but Lata Bordier he was crying out publicly for to you know give him what he wanted to stay obviously yeah. they weren't paying one bit of attention to it because if Martin was leaving they didn't really care what happened yeah, and, with Bordier. and that's the question I asked at the time I think during that barren run was either like come out publicly and back him uh, or or just get rid of him right now because what's mm -hmm. the point of being in this limbo where you don't want to support him with these contracts with the signings in January because you're unsure. Um, 
it just just leaves us in a sticky situation all around. I think it was a bit of a mess, and ultimately, I guess we need to draw a line under that and move on. Um, maybe more will come in the future of what happened. I'd be surprised. Still want to know what happened with Michael Loudrop. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, what I will say is, if we still do compensation for Southampton, it's not done yet with the news, as far as I'm concerned, anyway. Because like there were, two, you know, the whole two yeah. calls. It was very amateurish. Uh, amateurish. I'm not going to lie. Like having you know such a big loophole. You know, no, no one does it on purpose. We'd expect at the senior professional level we're talking about that wouldn't yeah. happen. So I'd imagine, what is it, like they are trying to argue the case when Southampton made the approach they were still in the Premier League. Yeah. Um, I mean, it's, it's going to go to, what was it, Tribunal possibly now. I mean, I think the two figures were warmer, right, in saying 1 point, was it 1.25, 1.75 mil? There's it was like quite a big difference between okay. them, yeah. I mean, chances are we end up with somewhere in between. I think everyone knows somewhat how it ends. But, uh, yeah. It's messy, you know, because it delayed Michael Duff coming in, and now, you know, Perot will get on to it later. But that's delaying things as well. There's never a straightforward yeah. summer for us, is it? Never, never, never. What I will say though is, um, I have seen a lot of criticism of the club in regards to why can't we keep a manager for more than two years? We're we're never going to build stability if we can't keep a manager for more than two years. What I will say in response to that specific point is. Two years these days is a long time for a manager to stay in a club. So I think Michael, sorry, Michael, I think Russell Martin was one of the longest serving championship managers by the time that he left. Um, and unfortunately, I think that's just the sad reality of where football is at the moment. So it would not shock me if in another within the next two years, we might be having the same conversation, unfortunately, unless you get promoted and manage to stay up. But then at the same time, you've been successful. So your manager moves up kind of how it works. You either don't perform and get rid because you're not happy or you overperform and somebody else snaps them up. Yeah, and also I think the criticism, why can't we keep a manager for two years? If we were sacking them all, I'd understand, but we're probably, I'd go as far as saying the most successful club probably in the English pyramid at having yeah. successful managers. Like look back over the last, I'm going to say what, just 10 years, just over 10 years, Brendan Rodgers left for Liverpool, Paulo Sousa, was it, I'm going to say yeah. left Watford, was it? Leicester, Martin, Leicester Watford, one of them. Yeah. Mar Martinez, Wigan, Porter, Brighton, Cooper, I know is mutual consent, but Forrest and then Premier League. And now Martin Southampton. No one has managers poached like we have them. It's because of the style of play, but also it's because they're young, they're progressive, and this a you know, we're, we're a good club to build your career. So Yeah. I wouldn't say especially that. Bob Bradley, he went on to really <sighs> uh special things now. Yeah, I'm, I'm gonna I'm gonna leave out the Bob Bradley Paul Clement era. That was a bad part in the middle. To be fair, Clement did a solid job, and and, and done his job in, on paper of keeping us up until the next season when he, he was an interim, shouldn't he? Yeah, like, he should have like, got us to the summer and then let's move on. Like I do say, Guidolin was unfairly sacked though. I don't think he should have gone. Um, he was as soon as the American owners came in. He was on borrowed time. They were waiting yeah. for a bad run, and and the bad run that came against uh, six in seven games against the top six opposition. Yeah. I mean, I've, I've had enough of talking about that era now, unfortunately. It's, um... no, it's fine. I just <laughs> never forget um, Mike van der Hoen's and missed header against Liverpool basically cost Sorry. Greedle in his job. He was... Anyway. He did a good job, didn't he? But wrong style of play. It, it was all downhill after Monk. Highlight was that 4-1 win against West Ham. Yeah. <laughs> and then what happened after that? <laughs> <laughs> Anyway, um, yeah. moving on in this season, so Michael Duff has come in and taken the reins. Um, maybe a bit belated compared to what we would have liked if the messy situation with Southampton wasn't as messy as it was. Um, what are your thoughts ahead of this new era then? What are your thoughts on Michael Duff, his play style? Where do you think we're going to go under him? I mean, hopeful. I don't think his impact's going to be as quick as maybe what a lot of the people, you know, EFL pundits, believe simply because I don't think people realise yeah. the lack of depth that our squad maybe has and also I'm not sure our squad was at all built for his style and by that I don't necessarily mean off on the ball but off the ball it's clear he wants to implement a style that we press extremely quickly and aggressively as soon as we lose the ball there is I know it's not just pace that's required to press it's also stamina intelligence but we probably had one of the slowest squads in the in the league last year we probably, and you can see that with the way with the recruiting, Janelli, Yates, uh, Key, they're all, they're all fast players. So it's, key, it's, it's clear what we're looking to do. Um, and then 
I like what he says, but also I nowadays I don't pay too much attention to what my manager says because Bob Bradley, I maintain to this day, is one of the one of the better speakers. He got me right on board in that first press conference. Yeah, honestly. <laughs> so what I will say, what we'll, we'll get, I know we're going to get to the preseason friendlies in a second. People saying what's <laughs> what's the strategy, what's the formations, what's the play patterns from the uh, Bristol Rovers game. I actually saw quite a lot, and I know because of the lack of depth we had in the squad, it was a poor result. But who honestly cares about results? Yeah, so, well, we can go on to talk about the friendlies yeah. now if you want to start there. Yeah, of course. So, I mean, one thing I've seen quite a few people say is they're not sure what we're actually trying to do. One thing I'd say straight away is that it's clear we have a different shape on the ball and off the ball. Off the ball, we drop straight back into a flat 5-3-2 formation, quite a deep shape. And I know when you hear 5-3-2, you think, oh, no, Steve Cooper. But it's not like that at all. Because one thing that's evidently clear is whenever we win the ball back, then we're straight away switched into a 4 one 2 one 2 narrow. And just for anyone who doesn't know what I mean there, I just mean basically it's a four one two one two formation, but there's no wingers there. It's all centre mids. And then your fault one of your full backs will then act as well, in this case wing backs will act as the attacking outlet out wide. Um and then as soon as we're losing the ball, whenever the opposition gain the ball back, but it's near the byline, we're quite often using the touchline as another man. So we're aggressively trying to counter press and win the ball back. So to see quite a lot of that from probably a misshapen shallow squad in one preseason game we haven't even reached the season yet i think it's encouraging anyway yeah i watched the bristol game as well i didn't see too much of oxford just to run through the results so obviously um we're going to talk about the reaction as well but um one nil loss to oxford there was a mistake by uh andy fisher i think is the main yeah. talking point of that game um i, I mean, do feel bad for him because yeah, he did same. well in the next game so it's a it's a friendly, isn't it? Look, all yeah. you've got to hope is that sort of concentration is better in in the games that matter. Um, I'd rather him do it now against Oxford in a friendly than than taking that into the season. And historically, we've got a really bad form against Oxford anyway. So yeah. let's just say that it was just one of them things, bogey team. We also then went down at home two 0 to Bristol Rovers. Not quite sure how. Um, I'm not saying that we deserve to necessarily run away comfortable winners. But we definitely didn't take our chances, that's for sure. Um, but yeah, there's definitely some positive signs. Um, interesting, you, you pick up on the change of formation in attack to defence. Um, I was going to ask, actually, what your thoughts are on how the midfield is operated. So you're saying it's a 4 one 2 one 2 Yeah, it looked like a 4 one 2 one 2 narrow. It's a, bit, it's a bit of a weird one because we're missing players as well. And obviously, the shape probably fell apart in the second half. Like, we ended the game, I, I think it was with seven or eight outfield players. We haven't actually played a senior league minute. So that sort of says enough about how you know many more players we need through the door. Um, I mean, off the ball, is three centre-backs, two wing-backs. So, obviously, it was key in Abdullah in this case. Um, but then when we switched back to the back four, one of them would drop back and the other one would push on. He acted more as like a free man just to rotate in and out of the diamond, they call it. Yeah. The front two stayed as they were. You know, you had like Yates, Cullen, Perot. I think Josh Thomas came on at one point. So the front two were pretty much always the front two. Um, and, it, you know, it's a lot of, I think it's a decent idea, but we need more, well, like I said, we need more players through the door. And ideally it, it would work better when, one or more of Allen and uh, Walsh come back to fitness because I don't know if we really have the personnel to do it currently with who's fit. So um, you're suggesting like one of the wing backs when we're attacking, depending on what side, is going to slot into one of the um, kind of, I would say it's Grimes and then two, and that's where they would slot in. It, it, it seemed quite rotational by that. I mean, it's, it's not like, right, you, the wing back you are now sent the mid stay there because if, if that's the case then where's your width isn't it yeah it's very much dependent on where the gaps are and if if we need to build or if we're countering um so i guess yeah. a better way to look at it is you're having you just convert it to a four at the back and then a little bit more fluid ahead then yeah essentially. I, I think calling it a diamond is probably the best way of describing what we were looking at in the build-up phase but then whenever there was gaps you saw you know he didn't do it exceptionally but you can see what josh key is going to do for us is he's going to yeah. carry the ball and try and beat players wherever he can um but what you said on grimes i think he would definitely be the deeper lion midfielder in that shape but then also like Fulton, i noticed he was quite further forward than i expected though even having said that grimes off the ball off the ball he definitely was yeah he um he pushed up just just behind the front two to press and you'd have the three behind again then. 
you know, it's one game. It depends how strict yeah. stuff is across the season. Like Porter, when he was here, you're playing a different shape every week. You're, you're suddenly Carter Vickers or Grimes is at left back and Norton's in centre mid. And I think with Duff, we're not going to see that just based off looking back at, you know, last season with Barnes. It was, it was pretty much always three or five at the back. That's the shape he did like. Um, mm. So, yeah, it'll, it'll depend on the opposition anyways. There'll be certain teams that that sort of tactics suit against yeah. some that don't. I was trying to work out, leave the front two out of it because it's quite self-explanatory what they were doing. Mm. You've got like Patterson, Cooper and Grimes in midfield. Um, and I know Grimes would step back and maybe one of the others is coming forward to make the diamond. Like sometimes Jimmy Patterson, like you think he's being used in more of a midfield role more than just a winger or attacking role that he'd be used to in the past. Do you think he's got a place like rotating around in that sort of area i mean he, he's good picking up the ball isn't he like he's one of those players that you can find a half a yard from nowhere but i think when we lose the ball i you know you don't back him to necessarily get back into position really quickly when his 1v1 duels what i will say yeah. is he did very well against ox uh, not oxford sorry bristol rovers i actually think he was probably our best player so you know one year in his deal he's, he's not going anywhere is he no, no one's gonna come in for him so there's, there'll be a role there, I, I, you know, physical games, maybe yeah. not, is what I'd say. I find it tricky to select um, and to see how some of the players are going to get a lot of time mm. this year in terms of, like, we have to see how the formation kind of pans out, but the midfield, because I can't quite, I'm not quite understanding fully how it looks yet until I've seen it a bit more. I can't picture how and Cham, you get the best out of an and Cham, Patterson, Cooper, um, at the same time, I think I'd play at once. Walsh, yeah. Allen, Grimes, Fulton. I feel like it's, I know Walsh could perhaps play a bit further for maybe, but um, I wouldn't be yeah. surprised if one of them leaves. You just said, to be honest, like I, I think maybe somebody else comes in who can play deeper, but I don't know if we've got one too many cams and Janelli as well because I feel like he's not yeah. up forward, is he? So the one I'm uh, saying specifically, I know there were links of Encham, they, they were, yeah. You know, unlikely links at best but um he's got a year left as well yeah yeah he's got a year left but i'm just thinking we brought him in on a free so we're not trying to recoup anything for him he's got de- you know quite sizable wages and there's murmurs that he's never really properly settled in J- just a thought i feel like that shows on the pitch as well yeah you know the, the spell at the end of the season when last year seven wins two draws i thought he did very well in that spell but apart from that he's never really got going it's always been like he's an impact sub yeah, it's a good game, and then like three bad ones is what he was before that, I think. But of all the players we just said, I reckon Ollie Cooper probably is the one who will benefit the most from Michael Duff because yeah, he, he wasn't as strong like in possession and moving the ball on quickly and accurately in the Russell Martin system. But what I've said, like counter press and energy, that is Ollie Cooper. That's probably his biggest attribute, in my opinion. Is he, he runs for days and he he's, he's an effective presser. That he's got good acceleration good agi- agility but he's probably better in like 1v1 defensive duels than he is his uh, attacking counterparts that we just listed yeah i think uh, liam cullen could perhaps fit into that bracket as well in terms of his energy and how much he kind of runs off the ball yeah you'll see minutes whether it'll be successful minutes i'm not sure yet i know like, you're not his biggest fan i no, i like him i do like him i i think for, for what for his salary you know like i, I think there's a probably an acceptance that he's not like a striker we're going to have and he's going to bang in 20 odd goals a season but currently his wage pack it, it, he'll be there and he'll try his absolute hardest and he always does yeah. but i think when he went on a pop uh, run of form last year i think he came back from the world cup and he between the world after the world cup and i think it was something like march he was you know it's on better goals per minutes and per row it was some something in the region like a goal every 120 minutes which is nuts. yeah I but, think he's a poacher and he gets in the right place at the right time. And, and I feel like that could work quite well like with another striker. So yeah, the point that was leading to was Russell Martin's system was probably churning out more poachers chances yeah. than you know the vast majority of assistants in the league. So I think much Russell Martin, in my opinion, probably was the perfect manager for him and now he's gone. I I, I hope he does well. I never hope any of yeah. our players don't, especially a you know, local talent, but yeah, no, I think I think there might be a place for him. But I mean, I 
I wouldn't expect him to be first name on a team sheet or perhaps start in week in, week out when the season proper kicks off. We'll have to see. But if uh, if he's going to persist with two up top, it could well be for maybe even a fifth striker in the rotation of um, yeah. of the squad. So, um, And that, I guess, you could also include competition from Josh Thomas, who... What do we make of him then? Where's his uh, season gonna lie? Are we gonna be? Is he gonna be stuck sticking around you after that really strong preseason, or are we gonna be looking at a season long loan in maybe a League One or two? It's tough to say, isn't it? Because the, the club used to stream all the under twenty three games, so we actually had a decent idea of you know where everyone was at nowadays. I don't don't believe they do anyway. So all you see is you know Josh Thomas brace, Josh Thomas hat trick, and you get really excited. We've always seen of him. He's you know really quick getting in behind, so he's similar sort of uh, style to Yates, which is why I thought he could stick around. But if Perot leaves, another striker comes in. You're looking the new striker, Yates, Cullen, Janelli. You've got four there already. I know Janelli isn't a out and out striker, but that is probably why he'd play in the system. Um, I suppose if it's interest or not, I wouldn't loan him for the sake of it. I really wouldn't because there's not many teams in League One and League Two which probably say what we're trying to do. So. Yeah. If the right offer comes up, I'd say yes, because it could be the making of you, look at Whitaker. But then there's plenty of players who go, like Kyle Joseph. He, he went a couple of times. He's, you know, he never really got going. So send them to Wrexham. They're looking for a striker <laughs> now, and they, um, after the injury they had the other day. My Mullin was injured, was it? Yeah. Was. He had a punctured yeah. lung, I think, in the Man United game. I think Ashley Williams had that. It, it, it's one of those ones that sounds really bad, but I'm not actually sure. A couple how of months, long. I think. Two, a couple months. months. Oh, God. Yeah. Um, but yeah, or well, maybe Newport. Newport tend to do quite well when we send people out, like Ollie Cooper, I guess. Uh, they do, but they're in a mess at the minute. So I'm not sure I'd willingly send someone into a mess. That's fair. Yeah. Did not realize. Um, shame to hear that. Is it money or? I'm not sure. I mean, they've lost uh, quite a few of their players on freeze, and they were sideways moves, which says you know something bad's going on behind the scenes. And if just look at their preseason, we beat them five nil, but then it became apparent when Bristol City beat them eight nil that maybe it was more to do with Newport than it was to do with. <laughs> so yeah, it, 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 hopefully it sorts itself out. League League Two is always a weird one. Loads of loan moves and freeze happen right at the deadline. So hopefully they're fine. It's going to be a tough season for them though. I hope so. Yeah. Um, okay, so the other, I guess, I know we got issues in the left back position, which we're going to touch on again when we look at transfers later. But maybe there's opportunity. Maybe we don't need to. We need to sign someone. But have we got someone there that's able to step in as a replacement already in Azim Abdullahi, who started against Bristol Rovers here? Um, looks like he's a bit pacey on the left wing, if you like. Could this be another one that's going to break through? What do you think? I mean, what I'll say is fair play to him because as soon as I saw his name in the lineup, I was like, God, what's this going to look like? And straight away, you can tell attacking wise, he's going to be a brilliant player. I think he's raw at the minute. So, you know, I, I don't think he was confident using his left foot at all. Um, but no, he impressed me going forward. But I think I'm going back, I believe, I don't know if it was the first or second goal, but he, it was his job to basically stop the cross. And he was a good few yards too much inside yeah. on the pitch and that's an experience and what i'm going to lead to as well that it's not his position he's, yeah i was going to say he's a midfielder isn't he yeah he said said the mid cam i believe but for him to step into a position like that and be called upon against senior opposition very well done to him i think i'd put him on loan i think he's got the sort of skill set that a lot of league two clubs probably would want yeah um but the thing is, there's no way he's going to go until we bring in a left wing back. Is he? If he's starting for us with our strongest, that was like our strong 11. If he's starting for us now, he's expected to be at least on the bench probably, right? Uh, next next weekend. I guess it depends on the transfers that come in. Uh, who replaced him? Ben Lloyd. Yeah, and again, sentiment. And I think he's less, I don't know if he's less in experience, but he's probably further away from the first team again. He was only on the pitch because he went up, went off injured, didn't he? Abdullah. Was... Um... I thought Lincoln McFadden would have been looking around. Yeah, to be position. to be fair, I completely forgotten about him. Not sure if he's injured, but yeah, he's no, a not natural, sure. natural left wing back, and he. Yeah, but it was the same thing with Rashisha all the time. He was struggling with the right back, and he never seemed to have a look in. How was the other one as well? We got um, like where's Ogbeta? Ogbeta's in just uh, September, I think. Rashish is in the ACL, didn't he? In the yeah, Rashish Rashish is left now. I think. Yeah, he's on trial of Reading, I think. Yeah. 
Um, okay, so yeah, so what about um, another one I, I noticed was missing? I know there's a couple of injuries on the list. So we got the Walsh, the Allen, Cabango's injured. Uh, he looks like he's back in training now. Yeah, the other two not gonna probably see the start of the season. I think Allen's due back before Walsh, and Bender's obviously got a couple of months still. Yeah, um, last time Cameron Congreve is he just not being selected here? Or it's a weird one, isn't it? Because Russell Martin liked him. Um, he's more in the twenty ones now, isn't he? I guess what I will say is, well, we've just touched upon how many cams we have, so it's, he's got a lot of bodies in the way to get through. And when there's a lot of bodies in a squad with described as shallow, that's only going to get worse. So I, I think he deserves a low move, but then again, it's do people want him? Or he's not? still nineteen, isn't he? He's still quite he's young. young. Yeah, he's got, exactly. He's got uh, time on his side. I just wasn't sure um, where he was in this new um, new era, if you like, because he looked like the one that might break through under Russell Martin. Yeah, it's, it's um, similar to like. Oh, sorry, go on. I was going to say, unless he's injured, he's not even making the bench here. So. No, I think he's a 21s job at the minute. I mean, what I will say is similar to people saying why Wettiger's left because he didn't really have a place in the team where he'd fit in. Congreve, probably a bit similar, his profile. He, I don't think he has the physical profile to play up front. Mm. You certainly wouldn't play him centre mid. Wing back, you know, it, it it's happening too often now. People are sticking wingers or wing backs, but they're, they're neglecting the defensive duties that they have as well, especially this one where one of the wing backs is expected to slot back into a back four some of the time. Yeah. So yeah, I think obviously football changes so quickly. He could go out on loan, maybe Welsh Prem. That's probably where I'd look to send him, and then he could come back, and Duff could be gone, be that for good reasons or bad reasons. So, you know, like you said, nineteen. I think he's got a couple of years left in this deal, so he's he's got time. I hope anyway. Yeah, just interesting. I mean, another one is Garrick, and never really fit in as well when he he was here a couple of years ago. Um, maybe a shame I was calling off a pace at the time and it just seemed a bit of a waste to not try and get something out of him but maybe that punch nailing a coffin uh, I mean go down in history I guess <laughs> <laughs> definitely one to remember yeah um, yeah so Whitaker, you mentioned him there um, I think he never wanted to come back to the and he never got his head in the game and I don't think we ever saw the best out of him really which was a bit of a shame no, I mean, it's, it's mismanagement again, though, because I'm fairly certain we rejected a bigger bid from Rangers in January than we've now yeah. accepted from Plymouth in the summer. And one thing I'll say as well, I'm not sure who's aware of like Market Insight, but they were a recruitment firm, very good recruitment firm, who did work for us, I, think, I believe, under Steve Cooper. They never really had a lock in from what I can tell, but they're a Plymouth now, is my point. And basically any signing they say sanction, any signing they suggest, it's because they know there's far more to gain than to lose. Obviously, there's the evidence of his six-month loan spell there where he was like the top performer in League One. But if they're willing to break their transfer record on him and they spend about a million, we've we have we have had our pants down, is the truth of it. Um, yeah. I just think, I sold it for a million. If you were to go to League One right now and buy the best player in the league and also with his age, he's like 22, I believe, you're spending more than a million pounds. Like when Ivan Tony... Well, I'm sure we pay for Downs. He wasn't playing though. He was cast out. Of the well, squad. it was still more than a million, wasn't it? It was one and a half. But like I said, he was in the reserves because he was forcing a move as well. Yeah. But what I say as well is like Ivan Tony, you know, is an extreme example when he was at Peterborough. He went to Brentford for was it ten? Five rising to ten. There's so for a championship club, keep in mind we are not League One, to sell him for a million pound. He could easily I know it's an extreme number, he could go hit, say, Eight goals, eight assists, ten goals, ten assists, because that's the sort of player he is. He'll contribute both of them. He'll be worth a lot more than a million pound in a year, is what I'd say. And I hope yeah. we have a sale on and a decent sale on at that, because he could even move up higher than play after somebody go in for promotion from the championship. I think it's a shame. I think I, I think the mistakes were made in January, and I I want to say Martin is partly to blame for this one because he obviously made the decision to recall him. I think it was a bit of a a last minute, like, um, I'm going to recall him because you're not backing me in the window or whoever made that decision. Or the board maybe were like, oh, well, this guy's doing well in League One. He's already one of our players. So we're going to recall him and we won't back you because we got him. Either I way, think the board, I think. yeah, e either way, whatever way round it was, whether it was Martin being too stubborn then to use him and obviously there was the whole thing about him not wanting to come back and mm. he said something in the media, threw his toys out the pram a little bit. We never really managed to get him back in. And he didn't really use him for the rest of the second half of the season. We didn't really see him much. Maybe he was having the cameo substitute appearance 
uh, now and again. I think it fizzled out the longer we went on. There was more involvement as soon as he was recalled than there was towards the end of the season. Yeah, in the minimum and, amount. Of yeah, in regards to his value, he was worth whatever was bid by Rangers in January because he came back on that off that good loan spell, and then we basically recalled him to sit on the bench. So mm. his value is going to go down. So if you're going to do that, you may as well have left him at Plymouth, so that we could have at least. I don't know, maybe it would have been worth more than two million now if he had carried on that output for the second half of the season. Yeah, there were three options when there was leave him at Plymouth, let his value grow more. There was recall him and sell him, and there was recall him and use him. And we went with recall him and use him, and then we didn't use him. So again, yeah. it's just crazy. And that, it wasn't that... even like we were necessarily doing extremely well for that entire time for him to not even get on the pitch. No, I mean it was it was straight after January. That was the worst part of our run. I think especially at the start, as you mentioned, when we were playing him, I thought, you know, it was a bright spark and something different. And it, it, again, yeah, didn't suit the style perfectly. I'm not going to say that he did. But the fact that he saw as few minutes as he did when the team was playing like it was, again, probably speaks to the disconnect between Russell Martin and the board. The way I probably see it is the board recalled him and then said, right, that's like a new signing for you. Russell Martin, although probably acknowledging he was a decent player, didn't want things, he didn't suit his style. Then the board dug their heels in on the fee for yeah. why, you know, again, that's the mismanagement again from Levy and we'll, we'll never know that. You have somebody who's so happy to sell players whenever, sometimes for fees that are probably below their value. The one time a fee comes in, you're like, okay, that's probably what he's worth. He's not wanted. Let's get rid of him. We keep an unhappy player around. And I don't know if we're going to get on this in a second, but it seems like from the Swans Trust, I don't know if it was like some sort of forum, Levian's probably still got more control than was initially made out when Andy Coleman came in. So, oh, I've, I've not seen this, so that'd be interesting. If oh, you right, okay. <laughs> yeah, so <laughs> I think it it was a bright summer, a bright start to the summer, and now it's sort of fizzling out yeah. a bit. So I hope the mood sort of shifts around because the Whitaker thing annoyed me. Now this news annoyed me. What's happening with Perot is annoying me. What's yeah. happening on the pitch isn't annoying me, but that's annoying everyone else as well. So it's starting to get a bit gloomy. <clears throat> Yeah, um, I didn't know that about the board. I thought Coleman was going to have more control. It seemed like he was going to—he was here. He was going to live here because he needed someone on the ground. I think that was his words to run the club. Yeah, and I, I got the impression they were learning from their mistakes, especially from January, and they were going to have someone placed here now to make those decisions, so that we didn't have to go through like, right, let me send this uh, email to Jason to see if he wants this player. Then he's sleeping because of the time difference. You've got to wait for him to wake up, and then all of a sudden the opportunity's gone, or the transfer deadline's passed, or whatever, whatever the reason is. I probably kind of dramatized it a bit there, but you know, he's busy with his other clubs and his other interests. I think sometimes it seems like stuff was put on a back burner for a couple of days, and that's why business was left late, and then ultimately no business this year. I thought we'd learned our mistakes by having Andy Coleman and now to kind of and they'd acknowledge, right, he's gonna make the decisions. He's he's bought into the club. He's on the board of directors or whatever, and he's going to be doing that. But you're saying that's not necessarily the case then? Well, what you just said there is explicitly what the club has said. But I think the quote that I saw was Paul Watson has been in constant communication with Jason Levian to see how we proceed with the summer. What it was made out to be was that it would be in communication with Coleman and, you know, the recruitment team. So... You know, maybe it was made out to be more than it was, but I think that was my biggest fear when Coleman came in was that it, you know, it's it's just another what, what was his name now, COO Chris Pillman. Yeah. So you know, I think what we have to we have to be careful because it's we're not even in August. We still got a month left of the window, so maybe yeah, we done to judge them fully. But I think Levian, you know, when someone shows their true colours, I think it's best to believe them and. You know, I I just don't think people really change that drastically that suddenly. Yeah, I agree. I, th I feel like the jury's out. Um, we'll wait and see what happens. Touch wood. What I would say is, so far, other than Whitaker, there's not been any. I'm gonna jinx us now. In a way, I don't know if I should say <laughs> this. People leaving, I was gonna say. I know we're expecting Perot, so I wouldn't class that as one, as long as we get a decent fee, and we'll go on to that now. Um, but yeah, um, we'll. St even the links are calmed down, I think, for outgoings at the moment, which I'm happy to see. But yeah, it's still a long time to go, so I don't want to get too far ahead of myself. But speaking of Peru, then, um, what's going on? I guess that's the question. What's going on? Are we gonna? Are we running out of time to kind of cash in? 
It's getting concerning, isn't it? I mean, I think when the Yokerez deal happened, myself included, everyone saw just thought, right, he's gone for 20. Yokerez is a better player, but, you know, he's a couple of years older than Pro. They both had one year in this deal. So we thought, okay, well, Yokerez has gone for 20. Maybe we get 13 for a couple of add ons. It's not you who say Yokerez is a better player after he came here and didn't do anything. And then we never gave him a chance. But I. I think speak to a lot of the people who know what they're talking about. Like, on, I'm not disagreeing with general. you. If you base it purely on the Swansea perspective, that's a really insane um, oh, yeah. sentence, isn't it? The Yokerez we had was, you know, not the Yokerez that Coventry had. They, they were, they may as well have been different players. But I think, you know, you got champ. I think Sporting they're in Champions League. You know, they're usually there or thereabouts. If you got a, a club of that caliber coming in and paying yeah. that much money for Yokerez, if, if a club of that caliber was going to do that for Perot, probably. What had happened by now? Atlanta yeah. was the one link, like the one big European link, and now they've yeah they've spent I think it's twenty something million on another striker. So that's presumably yeah. not going to happen. I feel like Perot um, flatters to deceive sometimes. His numbers are really good. I don't always think he looks like a twenty goal striker when he's on the pitch. Yeah, he's. Uh, I think <laughs> I agree with you. I think his composure is, is sometimes his worst enemy when people are viewing him. Simply because he looks so composed and relaxed, sometimes it looks like he doesn't care. He does, but you know, I think you, you look at his profile. He's got like a very wide frame, so he's actually deceivingly good at holding the ball up. Yeah. Not not in the sense of he's gonna win the first ball and then win the second ball and then hold, you know shove off his man. He's just very good first touch, very good awareness of vision, agility actually for somebody who's so large. But I think. The reason we're seeing a lot of championship links and not premiership or Premier League links is he, he hasn't he hasn't got pace, has he? That's the one thing he hasn't got. And I, I think that's, if he's that's necessary for the Premier League. Bit of a yo yo striker, like a Mitrovic, like a Dwight Gale sort of Possibly. player who you really get a lot of goals out of them in the championship, but maybe when they get to the Premier League, they're not as effective. So I think what he's got going for him is he's technically head and shoulders above the league, but at the Premier League he is just Premier League level, yeah. mid table Premier League level, then you don't I have guess, the pace to go with it. And then all of a sudden, you're, you're not really going to pull up trees here. I guess McBurney kind of showed that as well when he went up. Um, didn't, yeah. It didn't work. And he, um, he, I think he had a good half, second half of the season last year, probably the best stint since he had since leaving us. Mm-hmm. Um, but similar sort of thing, I think. Um, so obviously, some of the clubs still interested Southampton, Leicester, Leeds. You're in Leeds might not be interested, but they might be. Um, like, do we know anyone concrete information with uh, with some proper interest? Or is it still here, say here or there? Is it still linked to Russell Martin just because it's Russell Martin, that sort of thing? This is what's worrying. I don't think there really has been any concrete news with him. I think last year we put up a twenty million pound price tag, which scared a lot of people off, and it became abundantly clear that a lot of the media links to him were probably farmed by his agent and possibly ourselves to generate interest. Becoming concerning because that could be what's happening right now. I mean, you're looking at the fees, Leicester. Of you know, straight away they came down. They spent nine and a half million on Conor Cody. They've spent. Southampton to spend fifteen million pounds. I forget his name, but a centre mid from City. And he never played a senior game or one for Man City or something. And Leeds, on the other hand, they are struggling more financially. You can tell that by you know they've loaned out everyone. They've spent over a hundred million on you know prior. It's it's like it's a carbon copy of us when we came down. Basically, my point is these clubs maybe other than Leeds because they could be waiting on a sale. They've they've got the money now, and they're not making the move. So is it that we're asking too much money? Is it that the interest isn't really there? Is it that they know that we always buckle, so we'll wait and see for the Birmingham game? If he's not in the squad, then the, you know they, they, they have that to negotiate with because we're scared to play him. Are yeah. they just going to wait till deadline day where the price is eight million instead of sixteen? You know, it's so. What do you think he should? We should be asking for, and what do you think he might end up leaving for? I mean, a couple of weeks ago, I said 13 million rising to 16 is what I hoped and expected. Just to reference another podcast, um, All Stats, aren't we? Which I listened to us, a lead podcast, a very good one of that. They look at all the technical data. They looked at them from an unbiased perspective. They all said, you know, roughly about 12 to 15 as well. But then we're seeing murmurs, I will quote him, Vital Swansea, because he is quite accurate, in my opinion, with what he says. We'd be lucky yeah. to get eight figures with him concerning because when he says that I, I don't think that's an opinion i think that's substance yeah that's fair. so we're probably what, 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 what would you say based on that eight 
I mean, I was old enough for Giocares money, but I think the longer it goes on, the more unlikely that's going to get. So it depends. You've got to start asking yourself a question then, haven't you? Mm. Um, how much is are we relying on his sale to reinvest in the squad? And how much do we need to do what we need to do? And is that fee enough? Because that's that's ultimately what it's going to boil down to. If you're going to get eight for him and that's enough to get what you need in the rest of the squad so you'll have a better team for the year, I guess it's worth it because otherwise he's gone for free next year. Because then if you keep him and you can't reinvest in those areas and you are struggling the left back or keeper and whatever else to implement this new style of play and it's a massive transition year and then you're struggling and then he goes for free next year. Do you know what I mean? So as much as it might be a fee less than what you'd want and you think you should get more, but you have a worse season because you didn't accept the eight million. Oh yeah, and the, you gotta get yeah. as much as you can for a player, but also a player's only worth what another club's willing yeah, to pay exactly. for them. Like it seems a crazy situation to think he could leave for free because that would be probably the biggest pickup free agent from the championship yeah. probably in recent years. Manning will you know was saying what a big loss that was, and he is a big loss, but behind what with Perot and Grimes, he was the best player for us last year. Yeah. Along with Ryan Giles, probably the best left back, left wing back in the league last year. Parole leaving on a free, on the other hand, presumably after he hits 20 goals for a third year in a row. That's unthinkable, isn't it? You probably I have think, a queue of clubs a mile long coming in. I think him. he's gone in January if he stays, though. I think we'd desperately get three, four million for him in January. If mm. uh, depends on where we are in it. Like, if if mirac- miraculously in January we looked like we had a shot of the playoffs, they might hold out and risk it because I think he, he would reconsider signing if we went up. That's the only way he reconsiders staying. It's a promotion. Yeah. Um, but if that's not really looking on the cards, I think they whatever we can get for him in January will happen. I mean, with Paul Watts, you know, just I just can't see a drag in the January, and also we can't have a Kiefer Moore situation where we're turning down. This is what happened with Cardiff. He had a year in his deal, Kiefer Moore, brilliant striker. I don't mind saying that, regardless of like the bias. Eight million offer came in from Wolves in the summer, they turned it down, and then he goes to Bournemouth for three and a half in January. They gain nothing in yeah. that, in that, you know, five month period, whatever. I just think our owners would panic in that sort of way if that did happen. Yeah, I mean, we had him with Mac Rhymes, didn't we, not so long ago? Yeah, and he, the difference was I think he had the newborn, and that sort of helped him, you know, convince him to stay on. And Russell Martin looked like he was going to be here for the long term at that time. He had a manager who would always build the team around them. The only thing I was thinking a couple of weeks back was if you're Perot and a you know, contract is put on the, uh, on the table, right? Two year extension, but you have a buyout clause of 10 million next summer protects his value somewhat for us. That's probably what we can get for him now. He does like a year, maybe he stays, but then I watched him against Bristol Rovers and he was, you know, I don't blame him because it's, it's going to be the same with any player. He was gingerly, I think is the correct word. He was not going, he was not running as hard as he, he was not. He get injured. He was not, yeah, exactly. He wasn't going in hard to any 50-50 tackle, what have you. And it's because he knows, you know, it shows that a move's quite possible at least, but it just won't be for the fee that maybe we were hoping and expecting yeah. you know, in gym. Well, we'll have to wait and see on that one. I did want to cap this at 45. I've got a few more things to I, I, want, I want to get out before we finish. So mm. we'll try and get through these quickly. But a couple of links then. First one, I mean, we're going to look at the left wing back first. A little bit of disappointment in that Lee Buchanan, who I mentioned in our last podcast um, as an interested, well, a player we were interested in. Looks like he's gone to Birmingham. Um, if that's not been confirmed already, yeah, I it's been confirmed. Yeah, confirmed. Bit of a shame. Um, but yeah, we've lost out on that one. Jamal Lewis, another name linked you mentioned to me before we recorded this. I don't think he was ever really on. Um, where you were telling me wages are a massive stumbling block there. Yeah, I mean, I think everyone's panicking now because those are two, they both would have been good options for us. But I think Jamal Lewis, like you just said, wages. He went to the Premier League on a decent, for a decent fee. He's going to be on decent wages. Watford can afford those wages. We can't. That's what it, it would have come down to. I mean, he quite possibly would have chose Watford over us anyway. Who knows? But regardless, that's gone now. And then Buchanan, Brist, uh, Birmingham, sorry, got him 1.3 mil, which I reckon we probably could have afforded based off the fact we just spent what we did on Yates. But they've handed out pro- quite long contracts to quite a few players now. Quite a few people or quite a few players buying into the project, their new ownership, what have you. We can't be sanctioning a five-year deal in the championship regardless of the player and i think watson everyone would have known that so in my opinion that's what that would have come down to because wages 
probably wouldn't have been as much of an issue there, I'd imagine. You say Birmingham are sanctioning long deals, is it? Yeah, Birmingham, not us, sorry. Yeah. And they, 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 they have given them a five-year deal. There's, you know, even four-year deals. I'm trying to think how many people we actually have. I was seem to be three, didn't they? Three with an option of an extension. Yeah, and, and, and options are fine. Don't get me wrong. I think Grimes, we had a three-and-a-half-year deal when he extended. Obviously, you get him tied down. And then apart from that, I'm thinking, I think Whittaker was a five-year deal, which worked out, you know, didn't work out bad. We didn't lose money on him. A four-year deal was Joel Asaro. I think you probably get the point I'm getting. I like it, it gives you less wriggle room when it comes to each window. You end up getting stuck with players if they don't perform. And there's every, you know, he could come in, he could get an ACL and then never be the same. He could come in and, you know, you expect him to be good. You do all the research and planning to make sure you recruit intelligently, but there's no guarantees. Yeah. Like in Chalmers, three years, isn't it? And yeah. He's been hit and miss. Uh, I think Walsh, maybe. Walsh for three years. That he's maybe not been actually been two. So what's Grimes got? One year left now as well, and yeah, he's got two. Two. We're fine with Grimes for now. He's one I reckon he probably was... leaves next year. If I'm honest, because I'd be surprised if he signs on another time because he's going to want that move eventually. So unless that's unless we go up, of course. Yeah, but... it's one of them where it's promotion now. Where I have to have my opportunity, yeah. and I feel yeah, like exactly. he can play at a lower league Premier League team. But we'll you know, see what happens. I'd rather it be with us, of course. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, so Jamal Lewis maybe wasn't really ever on the cards. Um, and again, you mentioned looking into Europe probably. Well, that makes sense because I probably said his name wrong. Buchanan uh, mm. was playing in Europe before he came to Birmingham. I know he was at Derby before. Um, two deals that were reported actually by BBC as basically being done and dusted, but yet to have any proper confirmation. Uh, so this was reported three days ago on the 25th of July after the friendly we had earlier this week. Uh, Brighton keeper Carl Rushworth and Newcastle's Harrison Ashby are right back, I believe. Yeah. Um, don't know if he can play on both or if Josh Key can play on both. I, I think Key's probably more suited to the left from what I've read, but obviously that's about watching either of them play much. Yeah. So. Uh, but it looks like these are going to come in, but they're not announced currently yet. So let's hope that they do because obviously yeah. we just need numbers. And I think a lone goalkeeper is a good option because. I don't know if Bender deserves to not be number one, but if you've only got Fisher as a viable option right now. Yeah. I think a, a loan or a one year deal was what I was hoping for. I would have been disappointed if we brought in someone on like a three year deal and it blocked Bender out of the team. Because I, I probably believe he, he will come good. He's, he had a bad luck with in, injuries there. Of course he did. But, but I think he's 24 now. He's young for a goalkeeper. And I know Fisher's not far off a similar age, but with Fisher. Well, Bender now, did really well, didn't he? At Peterborough uh, before. Yeah, I think it was Peter Baran who was Swindon before that, wasn't yeah. it? Good goalkeeper, very good goalkeeper. And I think he is he's, he's suited to Margotson. I think Martin Margotson's come in now, goalkeeping coach, and he will help us set pieces as well. Yeah, I think wherever really he's things with, with you know, it, it's an internationally recognized coach that he's still England goalkeeping coach. So the fact we pulled him in, I know it's because he again. Again, yeah. I mean, he's, he's from Port Albert, so that's going to be a massive factor in it. Yeah, you know, that's got to have a contribution in there. Yeah, of course it does. But nevertheless, like Fisher will improve this year. I think Rushworth, I, without watching him play, he's going to come on a lot under him. I think it's important we brought Rushworth in mind because Andy Fisher, you've brought in by Russell Martin purely, say purely, mostly because of his ability to play out from the back, right? That seems to... Not whilst not being gone entirely, we're not we're not going to see anything like we saw with like goalkeeper routines from Russell Martin under Michael Duff. And then once you take that away, you've got a keeper who actually one v ones isn't the worst. But then when it comes to you know commanding your area, set pieces, he's not up to the standard, unfortunately. Yeah. So it, it, you've kind of lost your ability to say right, I should be number one because your greatest asset is now not obsolete, but not needed to the same extent it was before. Yeah, and I've heard really good things about Carl Rushworth, actually, so um, it'd be nice to see. It's just like Freddie Woodman all over again, in a way, where um, yeah. a young keeper from Premier League, so I hope that he can come here and do well. And, to, you know, you don't want Bender to come back from injury and immediately get the gloves back. If Rushworth is in and he's doing well, he needs to earn that too, so it's good to have competition. Yeah, of course, I mean regardless of whether the player's hours or another clubs, the manager's going to choose whoever the best performing player is, then they're not really going to care. They just want to win yeah. games. And with goalkeeper as well, if you're performing, this, sometimes keeping the consistency is more valuable than that other player who's that tiny bit better, maybe. Yeah. Anyway, so yeah, that's um, 
That's some good stuff there. Have you got anything you want to mention then that we've missed out? That any news from the Swansea uh, atmosphere that you want to want to discuss um, before we leave? Don't believe so. Like that may be a bit concerning. We're quiet at the minute, maybe too quiet. Yeah, it's gonna be quiet, isn't it? I was having to browse through my uh, regular sources earlier. Not an awful lot to kind of pull out of recent recent news, anyway. Which... No doubt there's stuff going on in the background. I know you touched upon um, the tweet from Vital Swansea that says we're looking for a left wing back in Europe. I think yeah. when it when it comes to signings from Europe, they're less likely to end up in the media that we see, at least just simply because you know you see a lot of UK links. You see a lot. There's going to be a lot of agents representing UK players that ends up in the UK media. So. Yeah. Yates was quite a quick one though, wasn't he? It wasn't necessarily rumoured for a long time. That's what I mean. It does happen quickly with us. I think we've, we've got a lot better at keeping it under wraps when deals yeah. do happen. Janelli, I don't there were no links there. That just happened. Key had been long, you know, rumoured, but that's simply because we've been trying in January and last summer. So like you know, yeah. we, I think we when we recorded the podcast with Gab Sutton, Yates was a, you know, basically announced, not announced, but the link and then basically it being confirmed was announced while we were recording. You recorded yeah. the whole thing, came out, oh, yeah, I know. Yeats has just signed. I was like, oh, I didn't realize you were in for someone, but yeah, no, I mean, look, we'll probably have another podcast out next week, and I hope there's maybe some more positive news going in ahead, going into the first game of the season. Um, I'm curious to see who he would pick in his team. I know we obviously we've got red in tomorrow, that's yeah. the last friendly year, uh, I believe so, yeah. Um, not I am uh, curious about to see. Like, I don't know what his first team is. I don't even think. I don't know if he knows at the moment. Obviously, I don't think what started against Bristol is his first team necessarily. No, I mean Perot obviously did. I don't think Perot started. Felton, I think you have to start him. It's got to be Grimes and Felton. And yeah, I, I mean, I'd be shocked if it isn't. Maybe, maybe he thinks there's no one to come on and replace Grimes if Grimes has to come off, but. What I would say is I'd probably expect Rushworth and Ashby to be done by Birmingham. I'd be surprised if they're not, simply because, you know, they have the yeah. parent clubs, like, I've got to want that to happen, right? They've got to want them to go straight into league football. If not, I mean, left wing back, it was Abdullahi. It could well be Abdullahi again. I, I didn't see anything else in the game. It was Norton in other games as well, wasn't it? Yeah, so. you, you can't play him left wing back. He, he's going to be centre of a back three. And, you, you know, you'll have cover either side of him then and he'll do fine there. But I think that's the only position because of his, you know, his age. Now he, he only played what was it like a hundred odd league minutes last year, which probably said enough. Well, he was. I'm not sure what happened there. I don't know if I fully agree with the way that he got phased out of the team. Mm. I because I, he was very central to it, and then it was like a click of a finger, and he just couldn't get a game anymore. Russell Martin did do that though. Same with like yeah. Ryan Leonard. He was in it. He was in the team regularly. Next minute gone. He just, yeah, and and he's and really they're quite similar in the way that. He kind of wanted to push him at the door. Like Norton was by all accounts gone until Russell Martin left. Mm. Um, not sure if it was a falling out or something. But what doesn't make sense to me is when we were so poor defensively that he couldn't even try and make that adjustment just to see if it helped. Yeah. He didn't even give him that chance. There was one or two games he started him at right back when uh, Latavoli got injured. Um, I mean, he's a I young manager and he made mistakes, didn't he? But yeah. It's a learning curve. It, it was just weird for him to go from uh, Norton is so central to my plans, his experience mm. amongst the young heads, he can pass the ball out from the back so well to like nothing. Yeah, no, it'll be interesting. Yeah. I, I think probably the only difference we're going to see Reading, or oh, it's not Reading, sorry, Birmingham. I mean, Cabango comes back in if, if he's fit enough. Yeah. Um, left wing back, you're probably looking Ashby or Key. If not, could well be Abdullah. It's be, it'll be interesting in the first couple of games. We always do this, though. It's annoying. We never have yeah. our team, our squad sorted for the first few games. We'll we, come out play four, three, three now. Yeah, we always fall behind at the start. Based on you know, it takes us a while to get up to speed, and you know, we only lost out by four points to playoffs last year. Yeah, exactly. Well, thank you very much for coming on, Ben. I know I said forty-five minutes, but we're going to end it an hour instead. We're, we're learning. We're trying to chop the yeah. forty-five <laughs> to make it more accessible. We'll get there. Um, it's difficult in pre-season when you've got so much to talk about sometimes. You think you haven't got that much, and then all of a sudden, it's an hour. Yeah. No, but, thank um, you for having me. I really enjoyed it. That's all right. really appreciate it. So I'm sure we maybe will see you again later in the season. Um, always welcome to come over to chat. We always like, like to hear other people's opinions, and hopefully Lee will be back for the next one as well. Um, but yeah, so I'm going to call it there. So thanks, everyone, for listening. As always, let us know in the comments 
all your thoughts about Swansea preseason. What do you think of Michael Duff so far? What do you make of the three new signings that he's brought in? Who would you like to see join them? Um, are you confident that they're going to be able to make that happen? And uh, what's an acceptable fee for Joel Perot? I think that's the big question on everyone's lips. So let us know in the comments below. Don't forget to click on the thumbs up button. It really helps us. We just hit 600 subscribers, so well on our way to our next goal, which is 1,000. Really been a positive month, actually, with um, uptake in subscribers. So thank you to everyone that has joined. And if you haven't done so already, click that big red subscribe button and you'll get up to date with all the latest videos we put out there. And of course, if you're listening on Spotify or any other podcast platform, leave us a review or follow us there as well if you want to keep up to date with all the podcasts. So once again, thanks for joining me, Ben, and we shall catch you on the next podcast. So see you soon.